All right, let's open our Bibles again to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. Last time we read through verse 6. For without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The idea of faith is an assumption that what you've heard is true, and you're going to respond accordingly, even if you haven't seen it yet. But uh, every indication, every instinct tells you that it's right, and so you're going to act based upon that belief. In fact, go back to Acts chapter 27, for a moment, Acts chapter 27. Here's a very simple, clear definition of faith. Acts 27, and we'll begin there, well, we'll read verses 23 through 25. Acts 27, verses 23 to 25. Paul says, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, that's who I belong to, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. That is a perfect definition of faith. The ABC of faith, an action based on a belief sustained by confidence. I don't think it could get any simpler than that. I'll go back to Hebrews 11. And he begins a list or a roster of great examples of faith given to us in the Old Testament scriptures. Let's read verses uh, 7 all the way down through verse 31. Then we'll go back and make a few comments. Hebrews 11, starting at verse 7. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, meaning Abraham, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came, uh, excuse me, from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that an Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith, Isaac, excuse me, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph, and worshipped leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel, and gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because he, they saw that he was a proper child, 
and they were not afraid of the king's commandment, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Mentioning Christ would have to be only in foreshadow and in type, because Christ hadn't come yet. Verse 27, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, uh, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the Egyptians, assaying to do, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down, after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab uh, perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. <clears throat> I want you to indulge me for a minute. About a year and a half ago, I decided to make a more concentrated effort to understand the language. Now, English speaker all your life, but you still don't know English very well, <laughs> uh, which is common with most Americans these days. Most Americans' own speech skills and language skills are woefully inadequate. But um, Ecclesiastes 8, verse 4, says, Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? To learn the king's language, or the king's Bible, requires you to learn the king's language, the king's vocabulary. If this book is the divine word of God, then it's perfect. It doesn't need to be updated and changed every three to five years. If, it, if someone says, I believe the Bible is the perfect word of God, and then he adopts a new version every, one, every time a new one comes out, he doesn't believe any Bible is the perfect word of God. No. It's very subjective. He'll pick and choose whichever he want, one he wants. He'll go from one version to another to another. And uh, that explains why so many professing Christians can't quote a scripture to save their life. Because they're not committed and they don't, they're not convicted of any of them. They just pick whatever is trendy at the moment, whatever the Christian bookstore uh, sells them, or talks them into, whatever is being given away free at some uh, Christian rock rally, and they say, this is my Bible. They don't know anything about it. But uh, my job is to believe it. The Lord's job, then, is to teach it to me. It's not my job to change the Bible. The Bible's job is to change me. Right. And the Bible's job is to change you. But a, a better appreciation of the language doesn't hurt. And I think it, if I could pass along any bit of good advice, I think that would be it today. I want you to go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 18 I'll give you a few moments to find it. Joshua, chapter 18. <clears throat> Joshua 18. And let's read verses 8 and 9. And the men arose and went away, and Joshua charged them that went to describe the land, saying, Go and walk through the land, and describe it, and come again to me, that I may here cast lots for you before the Lord in Shiloh. And the men went and passed through the land, and described, excuse, and described it by cities into seven parts in a book, and came again to Joshua uh, to the host in Sh at Shiloh. I'll go forward just a couple of pages to Judges, chapter 1. Judges, chapter 1. 
Judges 1. Let's begin there at verse 22. And the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph sent to descry Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. When he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let go the man and all his family. Do you know what the difference is between the words describe and descry are? Some of you might. I didn't until just a few years ago. To describe something with the word scribe contained in the root means to give a written record of something, a written account of what you've been informed of, what you've seen, what you've been told, uh, to give a, a, an accurate written account. To descry is to give an oral account, to repeat orally by mouth what you've been told, what you've heard, without having a written, a, a, a copied record of it, necessarily. And the King James Bible is able to use both of those words because its vocabulary is much richer than uh, any other Bible. All the modern Bibles, and I was checking all this this morning, all of the modern Bibles say that the spies went to spy out the land, to search out the land, to, to besiege the land, to make plans against the land, and so forth. But they give almost no credit, they, they, they make no mention of the distinction of, of uh, the words. To describe is to explain orally what you've seen, what you're observing. And then they give just passive mention to the man they found to show them how to get to, the, they, don't, they don't connect his help, showing them where the entrance to the city is, how to get there, uh, and then going and seeing uh, how to get there. But the, uh, that's sloppy language. It's really sloppy language, and uh, it's weak vocabulary. And that's what uh, I realized uh, we have a great blessing in the book we read. I go back to Hebrews 11. Notice our verses. Verse 7 says, By faith, Noah. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham. Verse 9, by faith, he sojourned, he traveled. Again, verse 17, by faith. Verse 20, by faith, Isaac. Verse 21, by faith, Jacob. Verses, verse 22, by faith, Joseph. Verses 23 and 24, by faith, Moses, etc., Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. Verse 31, by faith, Rahab hid the spies, and so forth. In each instance, there was some action expected of them to prove their faith before God. So it says, by faith. Yet in Sarah's case, there in verse 11, it reads, through faith. There was not much action required on her part other than to believe that the baby was coming. And their, her old husband was able to father it. Otherwise, there was not much action on her part required. So it says, through faith, her actions were rewarded by God. She didn't do much but believe the baby was on the way. And she was rewarded and recorded as a hero of faith or heroine of faith just the same. But the essence of faith, the measure of your righteousness was determined by your actions, uh, your obedience, 
and your works in the Old Testament. The modern versions all say, by faith, Sarah conceived. There was not much action required on her part other than to believe. So the language, see how a precise um, understanding of the language can yield a very helpful understanding when you're reading. It's not quite as sloppy as uh, modern speech is and modern Bible writers are. But read verse 7 again, back Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Righteousness, which is by faith, is established by the degree of your obedience in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Paul says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Titus 3, verse 5 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. No, no, no. Now, that's not the wrong, quite wrong verse. Um, <coughs> not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, Titus 3, 5. It's the Holy Ghost that washes and regenerates and renews the sinner when he comes to God. It is not measured out, it's not doled out based upon how obedient you've been up to that point. It's entirely the grace of God that the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Not the end of the law, period, but the end of the law as a means of obtaining God's righteousness. It's now granted by, to, by God to the sinner who comes to God by faith. Thank the Lord for that. But um, all of the modern versions want to say, by faith, Sarah conceived Isaac. That's also a sloppy distinction, or no distinction in the language or the vocabulary at all. Uh, in the Old Testament, the righteousness of the saint was based upon their obedience and their actions. That's how it was established. It was stated plainly back in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'll have you run back there. Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6, and this is a, just a, a brief introduction to the idea of rightly dividing the word of truth, a dispensational approach. Pastor Jinhas puts a lot more um, time into it, his ministry, than, than I have, but, uh, and God's helping a lot of people to get their eyes open that a proper dis the divisions in the Bible is the only proper way to understand the Bible. But Deuteronomy 6, notice what we read verses 24 and 25. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. Do exactly what he tells us to do, and it will resound uh, in our righteousness and the blessings of God uh, accordingly. That was still the in effect before Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Go forward to the book of Luke, chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 before the birth of Christ, even before the birth of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1, and it tells us about John the Baptist's parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, 
And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God. How? Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. That's how someone's righteousness was established. That's how someone's righteousness was defined and determined by their degree of obedience to the commandments and laws God had given to the nation of Israel. But it had to be maintained throughout life. Go back to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18. It's a... Uh, sometimes... Uh, a frustrating fact of the scriptures that you have to go from scripture to scripture here, there, everywhere to put it all, put all the pieces of the puzzle together. But God's testing your faithfulness. God's testing your diligence, your willingness to learn. Ezekiel chapter 18. Notice there verse 24. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, so we already seeing that a righteous man was defined by his level of obedience to the law, turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Peter asked in Acts 15, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear, wanting to require them to be circumcised and to observe certain dietary rules uh, that the Jews were obser observing? Now, those things all showed the degree of someone's obedience as well and measured their, their righteousness, an Old Testament way of thinking. But in the New Testament... I want you to notice 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. That's right after 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And let's begin there with verse 10. Paul writes, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. We talked about crucifying the old man, putting the old nature to death, uh, and feeding the new nature alive to the Spirit. If we suffer we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. That will be denying you a right to reign in his kingdom one day. But notice the rest of the text. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Your hope of eternal glory in Christ, verse 10, is no longer based upon your endurance uh, to stay faithful and not give up on God. It's based upon His promises to you to save you and to change you because now you are part of Him. You're part of Him. And uh, He won't take back what He's promised to you or promised to Himself. He's going to change you and make you like... This is a marvelous thing. Even if a person never serves Jesus Christ, he doesn't do much for the honor of Jesus Christ, he's too timid to tell some un unsaved person why they should become a Christian, why they need God to forgive them. He's not brave enough, he's proud enough to, to talk to somebody and even invite them to come to church. Well, they might be offended. They might hear something that hurts their feelings. They won't want to talk to me at work the next day or I'll be embarrassed. Uh, they're, uh, they're not even brave enough to leave a, a gospel track anonymously on a, on a bus bench. Or did any number of things. Some people, they don't do anything. They might go out and do a lot of embarrassing things 
while still calling themselves a Christian. That person earns no extra reward to receive one day in heaven. But you know something? That man or that woman who was once regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit is still going to receive a glorified body like Jesus Christ. They're going to live with him for eternity. They'll live in a, in a, a, a new Jerusalem. They'll have no more tears, no more pain, no more heartache, no more death, no more suffering. All those things will be gone away as well. They're going to receive all of that because of what Christ did for them the day he saved their soul. Talk about the, the um, amazing grace of God, the kindness of God, the, the generous and the blessings of God to do those things for someone who never gives back, never does anything back for his honor or glory. And yet that's the kind of God we live, we, we serve. He's not going to take back what he's already promised to do. The Bible says uh, that God, Ephesians 2, 6, hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you're saved, if you're a Christian, there's a part of you that is already in third heaven, united to Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. You and I are waiting for these bodies to run their course and finally be changed and our transformation become complete. But... Um, He's going to fulfill what he's already promised to do for you. And so your righteousness in the eyes of God is no longer measured and based upon how diligent, how faithful you were to keeping a certain set of laws and rules. <clears throat> you know, the Lord Jesus said, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven, or in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. You cannot see the kingdom of God. That means... Uh, and he said, suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. That means the gospel that saves, the gospel that changes the soul, the gospel that regenerates the dead spirit and makes it alive by the Holy Spirit, the gospel that can do all of those things, is simple enough that any child should be able to understand. And to make it more complicated than that is sin. Church membership, uh, a list of codes, a list of commandments, 10 steps, 32 degrees, all the you know eternal exaltation of the Mormon uh, beliefs, and so forth. But, uh, all of these things, none of those things can add to what, what God alone can do in the heart of a, a child. He did it for me when I was six. If God saves... What more can a man add to it? What more can man add to it to make you more saved? You're not going to be more saved no. if you join a church or if you get baptized or if you go through a CCD or confirmation or catechism class. You're not going to become more saved. You're either saved or you're not saved. Right. That's all it comes down to. And Christ said it was simple enough that a child should be able to grasp a hold of it. That's why the... the, the uh, Scribes and the priests were so upset. They saw the children praising Christ in the streets. They were jealous. They couldn't get kids to follow them. They wanted to enforce the commandments that had been passed down and then added onto by the rabbis for centuries. And say, this is how you please God. Not at all. So your righteousness with God, your acceptance in the eyes of God is no longer based upon how good you are, how good you've been in the past, how good you promise to be in the future. It's based upon he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, verse 12. And this is why we believe in doing our best to rightly divide the word of truth to see there's a marked difference between the things expected of men before the coming uh, and the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus for sinners and uh, afterwards we're saved by grace through faith. And we say that so casually we don't really dwell upon what that means. Saved by grace 
through faith. I believe what the Bible says, and I'm going to act upon it. I'm going to trust that that's all that's necessary. That's sufficient to wipe my uh, sins away, wash me clean, and give me confidence that if I died right now, I'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ. Amen. Isn't that the kind of hope every Christian should want? We say we want it. We say we believe in it. But you ask the average person, uh, listen, if you died right now, do you know for sure? Do you have any sense of confidence and certitude that you'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ? Well, I think so. I feel like, you know, we've been pretty good church going. As soon as they start going off another explanation, they're not saved. Right. You can just be sure they're, they're not saved. They're trying to get out of the question, trying to answer it some other roundabout way, kind of, you know, hit around the edges, make you think that, make you believe they're okay, accept them. But right away, you can tell when someone knows they're saved and they don't know they're saved. But I'll come back to this chapter next time. But, but notice, I want you to notice something here in verses 17 through 19. I'll make another comment before we finish. Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Why, that was a test. That was a test. I want you to slay your son on uh, Mount Moriah, a mountain I'll tell you of. And he did so. And the Bible says here he believed that God was able to raise him up from the dead if he did so. This is the kind of absolute confidence he had in the God who was speaking to him and revealing himself to him that if he does this for me he's, he gave me a son when I'm 99 years old, 100 years old never thought it would happen if he did that for me at this age in my life and he now tells me to slay that son he must have bigger plans he must know more about what he's going to do or can do, or will do, than I know. And um, so they went up to the mountain. He made the wooden order, bound Isaac, his son, who was going to strike the knife into his son. And God stopped him at the last minute. He passed God's test. And so he received him in a figure. But look at this text here. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. He that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that an Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence he received him in a figure. Abraham had already fathered Ishmael through Hagar. This is a salient and a very important text. God calls Isaac... Abraham's only begotten son. In a beautiful preview, foreshadow of Jesus Christ. If you're a Bible believing Christian, there's only one conclusion you can possibly come to that God has rejected the Arab and he has rejected the Palestinian in favor of the Jews through Isaac. The, uh, and by association, it means that the Muslims are the occupiers, not the Jews. And the Muslims, the Arabs, all the modern-day Palestinians or PLO or Philistines, whatever you want to call them, they're all going to be kicked out one day. They're all going to be rejected. That land was granted to Abraham and his descendants centuries and centuries ago. And God has never reneged on that. He's never taken back that promise. Modern politics, modern religion, um, modern movements who despise the Jew. People are jealous of the Jew. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Um, when someone's jealous of you, they can't see straight. 
and the Muslim, the Arab, they can't see straight because God has blessed the Jewish race, even in spite of its small population and size, has prospered that country like no other country he's ever prospered. Second, maybe second place might be the United States. And, and that only because we've been friends to the state of Israel. Once we stop doing that, watch out, this country's gone. Completely gone. It's just about gone now, but it'll be completely gone uh, if we ever turn our back on the Jew in the state of Israel. It's a modern miracle that the state of Israel even exists, that the nation of Israel exists, that the people who still call themselves Jews, after thousands of years of persecution, they still insist, I am a Jew. They may be holding on to some ancient promise that there would become a Messiah, a Redeemer. They rejected the one when he, they rejected him when he came, and they're still holding out hope that there's some faint promise of a future Messiah who will save our people based upon promises given to Abraham and his descendants. They should have received the Messiah when he came. By and large, most of them did not. So you still have Jews holding out hope that the Messiah will one day come. When, when Peter blasted them in the book of Acts, you killed the Prince of Life. They had the chance. God sent the Messiah and they murdered him. That's how they responded when he finally showed up. They didn't accept him as he was. They didn't accept what he was, how he was, how he preached, how he led. They wanted some conquering hero. They didn't want someone who was a, a humble servant who would die for sins. And so they rejected him when he came. Because his coming meant he, there was no longer any requirements to justify yourself in the eyes of God, except believe what God the Son was now doing for you on your behalf. That was something they couldn't wrap their minds around. Some did, but by and large, the nation rejected the gospel of Christ. And so you have a few Jews still holding out hope, but God made promises to their physical descendants to give them a land one day and give them authority over the entire planet. That has not been fulfilled yet in completion. And so the Jew still exists, waiting for that promise to be carried out. And you and I should be excited as Christians watching it uh, as outsiders, when someone trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior, whether Jew or Gentile, they are now part of the body of Jesus Christ. Yet those, um, and, and, and as such, you and I are then knit together with them as believers, as part of the, the bride of Jesus Christ from that time on. God still has promises to fulfill physically, literally, actually, uh, to the physical descendants of Abraham here on planet Earth. Do I fully comprehend all that? No. But I don't know anyone who does. Nevertheless, there's enough there. You can say, this is what the Bible reveals. This is what the Word of God teaches. All right. But if you are a Bible-believing Christian, there's only one conclusion you can come to looking at modern politics, and that is that God has rejected the Arab He's rejected the Palestinian. He's rejected the modern-day Canaanites. Uh, he's rejected the, the uh, Muslims by association and extension in favor of promises he intends to fulfill to his special selected people through the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why the Jews still around. He has promises yet to fulfill. That's why their language still exists after not having been used for 1,900 years. They had no flag, they had no nation, no, no government to rally themselves around until 1947, 1948. The modern state of Israel was established, and now it's a, it is a modern-day miracle to watch the way it's developed in the last 70 years. And uh, you and I should just stand in awe and see how God's preserved these people scattered all over the world. They all gathered back together like, like salmon wanting to swim upstream. They know that's where I belong. That's the language of my ancestors. That's the language we speak. And uh, we approach God that way. And uh, we, we enjoy the grace of God. And yet at the same time, there's a lot to be learned and appreciated from the Jew by his diligence and never giving up and not losing um, 
hope or losing sight that the God of Abraham is still watching out for them. There's still a lot to be learned from that, that example. 